Welcome to The Secret Witch Show, the podcast providing a safe and alchemical altar space of conversations which help powerful women escape a half-hearted, spiritless society and rediscover the freedom of living a wildly magical life. Every other week, we explore how to cast aside the wounds of shame, guilt and fear connected with fully being yourself, so you can grant yourself permission to stop hiding, ground soulfully back into your body, illuminate your whole soul desires, tend your soul, rediscover and reclaim your powerful gifts, express your magic and manifest your wildest alchemy. There's no better place to become who your heart longs to be. This is where we will guide you into liberation. I'm your host, Nicole Barton, and I'm so excited to dive in. Welcome, welcome my loves and oh do we have a beautiful show all about parenting from soul for you today which might seem a little odd given we're a show for helping women heal themselves and discover their healing gifts but our wounds do tend to show up in all areas of life and one of the areas that I see sensitive women struggle most with is parenting their sensitive children which can of course impact our feeling of being able to make time for meeting our needs and tenderly stepping into our gifts. Before we dive in though I would love to invite you into our Secret Witch Society Facebook community if you've not already joined or if you've already joined I'd also love you to know how welcome you are to share your heart in there I know women who listen to this show being secret witches can like to hide in the background and that is so, so welcome if that is your edge to meet. And I wanted to invite you, if you've not joined, into our sisterhood because sisterhood is actually one of the eight elements of our archetypal apothecary path. Journeying with like-minded sisters together is so deeply healing and it's also something that I resisted for a long time as I feared vulnerability and feared being truly myself. I didn't know that I was safe, I didn't know that all of me was welcome and that really is the beauty of our particular Facebook group. It's a rare and beautiful space. So if you feel a call to be held in the deepest of love in a safe space where all of you is welcome, then do head over and join us. Search Secret Witch Society on Facebook. On the Secret Witch Show today though, our guest is Leanne Brooke Tyler. Leanne is one of my own long-standing trusted guides. She is a shamanic healer, a teacher of wild magic, a podcaster and co-founder of Waking the Wild. Her mythical journey truly began when she was ruptured open to spirit with the sudden death of her father, which led to her mysteriously recovering from 15 years of chronic pain, panic attacks and anxiety. That inexplicable transformation inspired her to leave a leadership role in the corporate world to immerse herself in discovering what creates pain and struggle and conversely how to create a life overflowing with love, magic, beauty and truth. In this episode, we explore the crucial work of soul and sovereignty through the lens of parenting. We dive into the common challenges that many women face around parenting children who can often be experienced and labelled as sensitive, different or challenging in some way, perhaps also labelled as neurodivergent, and how we can navigate this when we ourselves are sensitive and possibly neurodivergent ourselves. We explored how parents of the sensitive young souls of the world often heartbreakingly feel like bad mums and what we really mean by sensitivity, how it is actually a superpower rather than a disadvantage and how we can begin to parent from our power, meeting everyone's needs and modelling a new way of love and understanding. Let's dive in. Welcome Leanne, I am so excited to have you on the show Uh, and I can't believe really that we're only just having you on the show given you've been one of my most trusted guides for the last three years and it kind of also makes me chuckle a little bit that we're talking to this particular topic about parenting given that neither of us really teaches that directly and it's also so kind of interwoven because of course parenting from power really is just another expression of living from soul which we obviously both do teach so so yeah, welcome. I'm so excited for this conversation. Oh, me too. Me too. And although it's the first time, I was just recalling, I think the very first time we connected, I was actually a guest on your summit years ago. 
Oh yeah, you were. You were exactly the first time, but it feels That's like it true. because things have changed so much. That's so true. I'd forgotten about that. I'm try- oh, we did talk about soul in that uh, episode Ooh. actually. Mm. Yes, I think that was your your invitation into yes. soul. Actually, it was. Yeah, it was. That's magical. I'd forgotten about that completely. Ah, well, I was also chuckling because when I read back uh, in our conversation this morning, I was just having a little flick back through our messages. Um, I seen, I saw that when I originally invited you to talk about this, I said, do you want to come on and talk about being a bad mum? Because my phone had like automatically autocorrected neurodivergent mum to bad mum, which I thought was hilarious, but also kind of very like meta because... Um, I think many women who are sensitive themselves and sensitive and have children who are potentially sensitive can actually feel like bad mums at times. So I thought that'd be a good place to begin because um, obviously it's an untruth. It's it's not true. Um, so yeah, what's your sense of that? <laughs> yeah, I love I love the way uh, spirit had its way with you with that. Uh, I love the way even the kind of most mundane things like autocorrect are a way that sort of synchronicity, the unconscious spirit, whatever we want to name, like guides us where we need to go. Great, great example of that. And I think that is a really helpful place to start because ultimately this journey of understanding why we have the challenges we do, why we have the struggles we do, why we have the life we do, Um, often begins with that notion of this isn't okay this isn't right this isn't good you know to the extent of I'm a bad mother often it starts with the the challenge and whether that be I'm I must be a bad mother or whether there's something wrong with my children they're not behaving in the way that my family culture school deems is an okay way to behave often that's how we first are alerted to there's something different going on Mm. but different being bad like neurodivergence in itself like it's basically divergence meaning difference but we don't we don't know it as a difference we know it as a like just difference in a neutral way we know it's difference meaning bad Mm. I love that and I'm wondering because I know some of the women who would be listening to this possibly aren't even aware of neurodivergence they may just have this sense of either something being different about them or something being different about their children or just yeah or some kind of deep sensitivity that they have so I wonder if you can just briefly talk to that a little bit as we dive in just before we do dive in around like what is what are we talking about here Mm. so this is I think it would be helpful actually just to zoom out for a moment because so when we're talking about things like neurodivergence, which has become, I guess, more and more almost like a buzzword in recent mm. years, um, which is a good thing and it's become more and more in our awareness. But as you know, we're looking at all of this through a very kind of like modern lens, which mm. really is lacking a deep understanding of the roots, the real reason any of this is even happening any of this is even a thing and so for me it's really helpful to kind of zoom out and look at the more ancient roots of any of the things that we might look at in a modern era and kind of only have a little kind of like oh it's this it's this and so if we start and I guess go back to what for all of us like for all humans is our is our heritage our history which is being brought up living in these really tightly interwoven communities and not just communities of other humans but yes other humans but communities with other uh, beings in the natural world the animals the plants but also the spirits the elements all of these things were what we grew up with as being normal for humans And that's the case for high 90% of our history. This isn't a kind of like, oh, it's a small slice of human history. This was the vast majority of our time on this planet was living in that way. Mm. That's who we are, really. That's who we still are. 
we may not live be living like that we might be bereft of that kind of community but that is still ultimately who we are what we've been designed for mm. and so because we are, are wired to have that kind of community we have to be open and sensitive to all those different types of connections that are required to have that kind of deep heartfelt connection with another human to have that openness to spirit to be able to have that commune that communing with spirit to be able to have the different kind of awareness to be able to connect to animals to birds to plants all of these require a different kind of open and openness and sensitivity that again is required for us to live fully as humans but doesn't work well in this modern culture mm -hmm. where firstly we just we don't even have that kind of community but also we are being bombarded constantly with all of the things that make up this modern world the bright lights the smells the chemicals, the electric le electricity, the devices, the news, all of this is like just barraging us constantly. And so all of us, all humans are kind of learning to close down, to not be open, not be sensitive. And yet some of us, that isn't an option for. For very good reason that I'm gonna to come to in a moment, but that's, I think, just worth recognizing collectively we are meant to be far more open and sensitive than we actually are. We've had to close so that we can even just function in this world. But for some of us, that's not as, as possible or as mm. not as easy. What's coming so to that's, mind there? That's the kind you... of first principles I'd love to kind of like open the conversation from. Yeah, I love that. So what you're saying then is that um, I guess, I guess what I'm, what I'm hearing in that is like, there's some people who are, naturally more sensitive um but what stands out to me about what you said there was that actually in ancient times like it was the sensitive ones were we were born sensitive we were kind of that's who we were and it's almost like it's almost like neurodivergent people were were the were how was was kind of like who we originally were is <laughs> i just made a real hash of what you what you tried to say there so i don't know if that's what you pointed to at all but um, but yeah, that's what stood out to me. So I think it's like where whatever we can see here in modern times is a is a I guess an echo of an earlier archetype. So even in an indigenous culture, you would have had everyone. There would have been a baseline of kind of far more openness and sensitivity, and then there still would have been those who were even more open, even more sensitive. The the shaman, the medicine man medicine woman, the doula, the healer, the these people who needed to have it. It may be that a specific area they were more open and sensitive to, or it might have been kind of like in all areas they were, depending on their role. All of this is perfectly designed. Like we all, we need this level of variety everywhere, but you know, even within a group of humans, we need that level of variety in order for people to serve their community to be part of the whole in the way they're meant to be and so i'd say all of us as humans are have this capacity for more openness and sensitivity than we are typically um aware of in our culture and there's some of us that mm. is, it's a even heightened degree of that but again because we don't have the awareness of that we will experience that in a way that has it feel hard and as if we're doing something wrong and as if it's um it's just one big struggle that we just mm. wish we could be like everyone else that makes sense so all of us are open and sensitive it's just that some of us need that more than others and then mm. when we're when we're the ones who are like that in a modern world that then presents as if we're difficult or challenging mm. yeah gorgeous yes, okay exactly. that's that's really helpful and I think that's that's really helpful to name because I think the reason that this episode came about um was because I was noticing for many of my own clients 
that they can really struggle as sensitive women trying to parent sensitive children um, who are often neuro neurodivergent, though sometimes may not realise it. And as I was going back through our conversation this morning, actually, um, I, did a, I did a search again of parenting and in our conversation, I was giggling to myself because we'd had a conversation after we'd agreed to do this where I'd gone out with Lily, I don't know if you remember, and um, <laughs> we went out for lunch and... Um, I think I sent you a bottle of an empty bottle of ketchup and she'd basically drank the whole bottle of ketchup whilst I was having lunch and, and just after melting down because she she didn't want a jacket potato that we'd ordered and she didn't want her chips because they were cut the wrong way so they those got uh, like queued another meltdown then, she, then they forgot her apple juice queue another meltdown I was just constant meltdown after meltdown and then eventually she stood up on her chair got, got her chips and like waved them around in a one like it was an, as if they were a one doing abracadabra mummy you're a frog with her chips and before then shoving both of her hands into ketchup pulling them both up so she got two red hands and she's screaming help <laughs> <laughs> and you just said tell me you're neurodivergent without telling me you're neurodivergent <laughs> <laughs> that whole scene like could be a metaphor for everything we've just been talking about isn't it it's yeah, so fabulous exactly yeah. and I remember all I did went at that time was laugh and I think before you know this work of deep soul reclamation that would have been a very different experience for me um and and yeah so I think that's first and foremost really important to share but also it, it's a great example of, of how because it kind of breaks my heart that that in our culture innocently from wounding people would have seen and judged and been looking at this as like her being a difficult child who needed punishing um and I think so many women can experience that and feel judged whereas I, it didn't even occur to me that that was <laughs> something that something was potentially happening until I started thinking about this conversation I think what you're uh losing to that I think is such a um, a crucial part of this journey of accepting again whether we use the word neurodivergence sensitivity whatever this this way that we're starting to recognize like there is a difference here whatever that difference is there is a difference here whether it be for me personally whether it be for my child and often we'll start to notice that it may be that we notice it first for our child and then start to realize like hang on I'm remembering now I was I, I was I was drunk I was struggling with similar things when I was a child or similar the mm. reflections were being given to me and we start to perhaps our own journey of recognizing our differences starts with our children but either way there is that place where we begin that journey and what's so important for those of us that are also parents is that we do our own work to heal and I don't mean as in like we can somehow put life on hold, go away, do our healing, and then it's, we're okay and fit to be parents. Like often these things are happening all at once and they provide the very material to show where the healing's needed. But if we've been parented and raised in a culture that doesn't understand any of what we're talking about here, makes it wrong, really values functioning, behaving, fitting nicely into a system where people know how to do the thing and follow the rules and, you know, not react in certain ways to things that we should just be able to get on with. If we've been raised in a culture, the prizes, that kind of like, just keep going and fitting in, we are going to need to do our own work to heal those wounds and also free ourselves from that conditioning to even recognize its conditioning. Like it, it we can, we can be so brainwashed that it's a bit of an extreme word to use, but it is, you know, it really is so brainwashed into thinking the right way to do things is to, you know, like I've had the image of, you know, Victorian children in these like very smart outfits and, you know, must, must be seen and not heard and not moving. It's like, it may be not as extreme as that, but if that is sort of the ideal that we have of what it means to for a child to be seen as good, any place that we have that in our psyche needs to be looked at because we will be we will be absolutely reacting to our child from that place. Like, oh my goodness, what will people think? What will they become? All of that will come up for us. 
and the only way to be able to respond to them in a different way to perhaps how we were responded to how the culture responded to us or respond to the children is that we need to start first Mm -hmm. we need to really do the work to recognize how that is all inside us Mm, I love that so much and I um, particularly love how you talked there around like we don't need to go off and run away to the woods to do that like we're here to (laughs) it's part of life it's like it's the material for our liberation um to to heal that as part of our journey through life um which feels really important because I think many people have this perception of healing being something that we go off and do and then we come back and it's all good um so yeah I love I love all of what you said there uh, let me just see if there was anything else in that actually um that you just said because I think there's there are a couple of points in that I'm just trying to remember them um maybe we'll come back uh because the other the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about and in, in, invite you to share is your own journey I know we briefly talked about this um before we pressed record um I know obviously you're you have uh, identified as being neurodivergent and you talk about it a lot and sensitive um so I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your own journey with uh, specifically as a neurodivergent parent I think for us uh, as a sensitive woman also we talked about you being parented yourself by um a neurodivergent parent so I just wondered if you could share a little bit more about your own journey mm. yeah absolutely so Again, as I was um, saying then, often we will have a a member of the family that we start to recognize like, oh, hey, there's something going on here. And then it's like, kind of like, whoa, this this is like neurodivergence all the way down. As in, we're like, okay, maybe I am. Hang on, with my parents? And we start to like realize like, oh, Mm. this didn't just start here. Like that's so common that we'll have that experience. And Although although it, we weren't aware of it at the time, it's so clear now that um, my father was autistic, like so clear. I mean, it, it, if, if he was around in this day and age, I think it would just be like anyone would know that. It was so obvious. Um, but I think we just saw him. He was like absolutely brilliant, like a, a complete genius polymath. Um, but had his very like we'd often say um oh that's just him being him like he just had a very different way of being in the world to most people but we just kind of like accepted that's how he was and um and so because of that I was very fortunate that he had a level of I guess sovereignty and acceptance of himself that he very much to a large extent parented me from that place and so I I think in some ways that made made it so it was much later that I actually realized that I was different because it wasn't different in terms of, you know, in our whole household, you were who you were. It was okay to have these quirks and things that were how you showed up that were perhaps different to the world out there, but it's okay, everyone's how they are. And so for me, it wasn't until I was in secondary school, which is quite late, I think, really, that I started to like come up against what was expected and realizing the places that I didn't fit that. And so it was quite dramatic, really, in that I went from being um, a very, I guess, accepting, confident, wild, free child to around the age of perhaps 14, starting to think like, my goodness, what's going on? There's something wrong with me. I've gone from being like so accepted and even celebrated for how I am to it being completely wrong, shameful, painful. Um, The latter years of secondary school were just excruciating, absolutely excruciating. And so it felt as though there was this just complete, um, like almost like two, two parts of my life that happened where it was like, well, there was this part and then this part where I was just brought present to like, oh, I just don't fit. But I still didn't know. I think, again, because I was raised by an autistic man who didn't know he was autistic and I was autistic, but didn't know I was autistic just then. I just I, I it was just this like, OK, I don't know what to do with this, but I need to learn how to somehow operate. So most of my adult life had been that journey of like, what the earth's going on? Why do I struggle so much? Why am I so different? And then as we've culturally become much more aware of 
neurodivergence and the different ways it shows up, which actually is a, another interesting lens that perhaps if we get a chance we can talk about there were certain things like I have a real struggle with numbers as, as you'll know and realizing like oh that's explained by dyscalculia so from quite an early age I, I was aware there was like places that I was different that could be explained using these terms um, but it wasn't until um nearly 10 years ago when I met uh, my co-founder Jonathan that he was the first one that recognized like surely you're autistic and I was just like oh, my goodness I remember I was quite offended at the time and like just like he's got no clue but it, it sort of sowed that seed of like okay well I don't understand why he'd say that like at that time still there was this a stereotype like autism comes in one flavor which is rain man and if you're not rain man you clearly aren't like and i'm not rain man so how dare you and um over that this last decade um there was the more i became aware of what that actually means and again we've we've because we're just doing our best to understand something but not from a first principle perspective we had this idea that these like different types of neurodivergence will call this autism this adhd this dyspraxia where i don't honestly think it, it, it's helpful to an extent but i think to a large extent that doesn't really exist like nature did not create these things that are like this is this this is this i think it's mm. true to say there's almost like a spectrum of neurotypes and there's a more um sort of typical way of of being and then there's a kind of more divergent way of being, but we're going to be sort of like scattered around all of that. And then we've done our best to group them and name them, but it's not really how it works. Mm -hmm. And so as time was going on, I was just like, my goodness. So if, if I were to look at myself from this idea of these different types of neurodivergences, I've pretty much got almost every single one of them. I think the only one that's like, I haven't got is dyslexia I pretty much got all the others <laughs> um and I ended up deciding to go for an autism diagnosis which is is what the only thing I've actually been diagnosed with although it's clear there's again through that modern lens of labeling there's there's other neurodivergences going on um and it it really then explained so much. Like by the time I had the diagnosis, I was fairly clear that's probably what was happening. But it really explained so much of, oh, that was why my journey was the way it was. That's why I struggle here. That's why, you know, despite all my attempts to, I don't know, cope in a situation where there's bright lights and, you know, a weird environment, I really struggle. All these things like suddenly just began to make sense. But also then, of course, there was like the next generation coming up in our family and then realizing, like, of course, now it's so obvious that's true for the next generation too. other people in my extended family. They they aren't what we would typically call neurotypical. And now we understand that we can meet all of those things in a way that helps them to guide, um, to, I guess, navigate this world like we can't just change this modern world overnight mm. but we can learn to navigate our own our own soul through it in a way that is is more aware more gentle more conscious more understanding of what's actually at play so that mm. that's really been um that's a bit longer than I meant it to be but that that's been my journey yeah gorgeous no I think it was really helpful actually um hearing that um and just it just gives it that bit of context as well I think um there's a there's almost like a couple of places that I could go here one of the plate one of the things that I wanted to ask when you talked about labels is how helpful labels are because I think a lot of women will potentially also be contemplating you know getting diagnosis and uh, we had Lucy Pierce on the show recently and she was talking a little bit about this but I just wondered what your view was on it as to how helpful it is because like you you know when 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 I see health and um including mental health and all of the things you know it's it's really just a collection of symptoms that's an expression of something rather than necessarily needing a label um so yeah I'm just curious on your view of that yeah, I think that's a really, really important conversation to have. And I don't think there is a a right answer uh, that's across the board. 
you know this is true for all people really the primary reason i i personally had a diagnosis there was certainly and i think this is quite autistic in itself there was certainly this kind of like i would just like to know you know like if i'm going to talk about this as part of my work which increasingly it seemed important to do so i would like to know and it's not that you need to know it's not like that's true for everyone but for me there was this just like i I want to have that kind of black and white knowing that i can now speak from that place there was also that just if if i am able to speak from that place it's going to be really helpful for other people and so at that point when i chose to have a diagnosis my my own sense of self my the way that my life had been created it didn't really make a difference to me personally the people who are around me know and love and accept me for who i am my life has very much been created in a way that is really supportive to you who I am my needs my gifts so it really wasn't a kind of like I need this in order to be able to kind of function or get the support I need um but for those reasons it felt like the right thing to do for other people it's a completely different decision it could be that for them it it doesn't you know they're not planning to talk about it in in the way that I do with my work therefore that isn't a reason to do so but on the other side, it could be that, and whether this be for their child or be for themselves personally, there are uh, forms of support or adjustments that having a diagnosis would allow them to have made. And if that's the case, there's always going to be this kind of weighing up, okay, it's going to bring this with it, but it will bring this, and therefore that's what feels aligned. And for each of us, I think there is this just recognising right now in my life, having a diagnosis would provide the ability to do this this and this or does it not or is it kind of like it would give me that but it's it's it doesn't really feel and again bearing in mind we're in a culture that doesn't really understand these things has judgment around it has a a lens on it like these are disorders illnesses something wrong with us that it does like it comes with a, a kind of price to pay in a way as well and so There is genuinely, I don't think a kind of like it's better to have a diagnosis or it's not better to have a diagnosis. It's so about where someone is in their life and what's going to allow them to ultimately live a fuller life, a more aligned life. Mm, I love that. Yeah, that's beautiful. It's about making a a conscious choice for ourselves, really, Mm. which I could have guessed would have been your answer. (laughs) I think it's a really important thing to speak about consciously because I I think again we can either have these like labels are bad or labels are really important Mm. and it's just like it really does depend like you just said it depends yes beautiful the other thing that I wanted to talk about which I think you started to speak to and I know is is an important part of our conversation was this idea because when we often when we do have the labels um people can then if you know when we're talking about it in conversation I'm thinking about my own personal experience with Lily Um, who's meant to be starting school in September when I can go into schools and ask how they deal with sensitive children how they support them we can get onto this idea of neurodivergence and they will immediately say oh we've got the special needs team and etc etc so it can often be seen as a disability um which I very much having you know having worked with you and um just that been on that whole journey I very much don't see neurodivergence and sensitivity as a disability um so I think that would also be quite a good area to explore as well mm. and so if you would you be able to just um would you name that as a question I just want to make sure yes. I, I fully understand what, what it is you yeah want. I guess I guess for me I've seen that being sensitive has its own gifts as opposed to being seen as something that is something that hinders us so I guess can you talk a little bit more around the gifts of being a sensitive mm. woman and having sensitive children yes yeah I love that thank you so this I guess goes back to part of the reason that having the diagnosis for for me personally felt aligned and I don't think I actually really had a that's become clearer actually since I think I had a sense of it but I don't think at that point it was like absolutely clear Uh, but it's certainly become clear since so 
I, as you know, I have spent the last few years in hard history training uh, to be a shamanic healer, shamanic practitioner. And the, what I didn't know until this all sort of happened around the same time, that getting that call to shamanism was happening at a similar time that all of this was coming into my awareness. And so it was like I started to join the dots, but at that point it wasn't crystal clear in the way that it is now. But it all started to emerge like, ah, this isn't just a coincidence that over here I'm autistic and over here I seem to be kind of wired in a way that allows me to work in what we could say as a shamanic fashion. They seem as though increasingly they're one and the same thing which is so odd because no one talks about that. Like, why would they be one and the same thing? But I kept getting these clues and these like ways that they were one and the same thing. Uh, one of the one of the most just like beautiful synchronicities, because it happened literally within weeks of each other, was I was um, choosing into the Germanic path, having the autism diagnosis, and then read this research that was about, and it was very much approaching it through this lens of like autism and dis disorder, but there's this research done that was looking at uh, the pineal gland and how it metabolized DMT. And so I'm sure many of your listeners will know DMT is known as a spirit molecule. It's the, it's what allows things like psychedelics to have the effect they're having. So it was shown in this research that the autistic brain, it naturally hypermetabolizes DMT, but specifically the DMT that's actually already is endogenous to the, the brain as it's already there, it's innate, it's natural. Um, so all humans have this, but it's such a minuscule amount, you wouldn't really know. However, the autistic brain hypermetabolizes it, uh, i.e. it allows it to have a greater effect. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. So we've got autism over here that suddenly has this link to DMT. We've got shamanism over here. And obviously an aspect of shamanism is going into trance and specifically working with plant medicines that often are psychedelic. That's interesting. So all of, I was getting these kind of synchronicities that were just so like, wow, who knew? Who knew that? Um, and then over time, as I the deeper I went into that work, it was like, oh, my ability to dissociate and kind of like open into other, other. I didn't know it at the time. I mean, I wouldn't have called it then other realms. I'd had a lifetime of almost like coming up and out of my body and it being a problem. Suddenly it's like, oh my goodness, I can drop into trance like that, where other people may need, you know, huge amounts of drumming or the right circumstances, or even say, for example, to take a psychedelic, for me, dropping into trance is like just easy as pie. And so it was these things that were starting to like, these are, these are literal gifts. These things I thought were a problem are gifts. My sensitivity to what's going on around in my in my awareness which again had always been this problem where it's like I can't be in certain environments because it's like I just feel like I'm always being attacked by the things that are in the environment like the light the smells the noise all of a sudden that heightened sensitivity was allowing me to be aware of the different energies the different beings the different spirits that were present that weren't available for someone that were was kind of operating only in this. Um, I don't think it's ever true that we're only oper operating. Our awareness may only allow us to be kind of uh, present to what we could call it like the gross realm, the material realm. I was naturally able to attune to everything that was present at these other places, not everything. Again, I'm sure there's plenty more I'm not present to, but like so much more that I was naturally present to because of the sensitivity. And so um, one example that you know of, because it's so deep in our work, is that uh, creating a relationship with a tree, a being that we, you know, again, our modern world just see as a tree. And yet there is so much more there, so much more in that relationship, the communion, the conversation, the gnosis. We have to open up. We have to be sensitive to be able to receive that. So all of these different things were starting to become come into my awareness of like, 
this isn't a mistake. Like the way these things that are different about me are literal gifts when I can apply them in the way they're designed for. Then mm. they were a struggle. When I'm in an environment that doesn't account for that, they are a struggle. They are a challenge, undeniably. Mm. But when I'm in an environment and when I'm aware of how they can be used as gifts, they are truly gifts. And mm. so I'm, I'm using, mine's quite an exaggerated um, example, but it's helpful because it allows me, what I'm talking about here are really principles. It's not to say that um, all neurodivergent people are autistic. And again, bearing in mind everything I've said, these are kind of made up labels anyway, but it's not to say everyone that's neurodivergent is the far extreme of say being autistic. And it's not to say that everyone that's neurodivergent is here to be a shaman. And yet what it's showing us at a principle level that these different things that we consider as as problems, as, as special needs, as disadvantages, absolutely do allow us to open into things that aren't um, obvious to us in our material modern world where we think that's all that exists. And so that's going to be very different for each person, depending on their soul, depending on their particular gifts, pretending on, pretend, depending on the role they came into play. But my my own path, my own experience just illuminated like that's what's actually at play here. There is a we'll need to all be on our own journey of how showing seeing how that shows up for us. But what's true for me is true in its own way for anyone who has these kinds of sensitivities. Mm. That makes so much sense to me from a from a perspective, as you know, you know, with the development of the archetypal remedies. And you think about archetypal phosphorus, which is typically the birth constitution of women who are here to be healers. Archetypal phosphorus is so deeply sensitive and so open to other worlds and has this kind of neurodivergent piece in it. So um, everything you just said um really makes sense to me and uh is so gorgeous for especially and, and healing I think for so many women who are maybe listening to this and really feeling like everything has been a challenge and yet there's like also so much possibility for us to discover our gifts within that yes mm. and again it's such an invitation it's not to say again that what I'm saying is literally the same that's true for every other sensitive woman. But there's something in what I'm saying that's an invitation, like what is true for you? Mm. Because what I do know is this isn't a mistake. Mm. Our soul came here with this particular body, this particular way of being for a reason. What's mm. the reason? Yeah, gorgeous. The other thing that um, you spoke to in there is like the... <laughs> almost like fitting that into the modern world and what um what was coming up for me as you were speaking there was around like almost like this journey that I've been on as well of like meeting my own needs as a sensitive person in order for me to be able to express those gifts and I just wondered if we could talk a little bit to that because I think that's potentially one of the biggest things that women who are parenting sensitive children who are sensitive themselves may struggle with most mm. You read my mind, actually. Um, I, I was just thinking something similar because I feel like we, I think we needed to kind of focus on what we're talking about itself at a kind of personal level. Mm. But coming back to there is a almost like a double challenge here, but also a double gift that we're talking about this as mothers. And therefore, also, how do we do that when we have those sensitivities ourselves and we're also parenting? And we're almost regardless whether we're parenting sensitive children or not, it still brings these challenges. And the thing that I, I feel is, this is true, I think, actually, for, for all, all of us and all of us that are parents, I think particularly those of us sensitive, is the importance of allowing ourselves to know and honor our boundaries and recognize that without doing that we're not going to be able to parent we're not in a way that's actually um conducive to us and our child and certainly sustainable and again because we culturally have been made wrong for you know needing for example uh more time on our uh, on our own just just as an example it may not be true for every neurodivergent person but that's an example 
when we've been told we should be kind of access all areas to our children and not have time to ourselves and not have a boundary of like right now, you know, I need just a bit of time just to be here on my own. When we've been told that's not OK, and we shouldn't have those needs. It's, it's again, requires deep healing and deconditioning work to recognize like, oh, these are boundaries I need to have in place so that I can meet those needs so that ultimately I can be in um, right relationship with myself but then ultimately my child where I'm not in this like frazzled um, just burned out whatever the way it shows up for a state and then attempting to parent from there which you know I think most of us know is something that we can't sustain for very long and it worked well for us and so that I think is it doesn't make it easy. I'm not saying like, oh, therefore knowing that we need to know and honor our boundaries kind of makes it okay. Like that is the work in itself. Like what, what does that look like for us? What comes up for us when we think of needing to honor a boundary? What does that bring up in terms of that fear of being a bad mother, of judgment? Like it's going to bring up so much material, even in that work of identifying it. Um, what I will say, and I'd love to know your, your sense of this is, it starts to become um, a really beautiful kind of like self-fulfilling prophecy. And the, the more that we do that, the more we start to come in contact with our own power, where that becomes this like snowball that rolls, that gathers speed, where it becomes just easier and easier for us to honour our own boundaries and needs. And, and this is the beautiful thing, again, for us as parents, to model that to our children where they witness us honoring what's true for us. And just like my father did without even realizing that's what I didn't know what was happening. He was modeling this to me. Like it's okay to be who you are, to need what you need, to desire what you desire, to live as you need to live. I was so fortunate. I was given a role model that is so rare culturally. That's the invitation for us now as sensitive mothers we can role mod model this to our children. Mm, it's so okay beautiful. for you to be who you are and need what you need. Mm, that's so gorgeous. And as, as you were saying, I, I'd be interested in your own view on this. I was like, oh, what is my view? And then I was like, oh, bless. Because I remember being in, in the bath or running a bath the other week. And Lily just like, she was like, mommy, where are the rose petals? <laughs> it was just like so normal for her that I would just, I, I was missing the rose petals in the bath. <laughs> and I was like, that's so beautiful. Cause she just assumes that now we always have baths with rose petals. Cause she has them in hers as well. Um, but yeah. <laughs> What's your sense in terms of like how, has that become easier for you to have that sense of like, this is what I need and it's okay that I need that? Because mm. it can yeah, sound like just... horrifying, I think, to some people, you know, when they're beginning that journey of like, it's okay that I'm sensitive here, it's okay that I have these needs. That can seem like quite a scary proposition, couldn't it? Yeah, it definitely can. And I think there's almost like, for me, my own journey was almost like it started off with me not meeting my needs at all. And then swinging to the other way where I was like, right, sod everybody else. I'm just going to take what I need. And, and there's been, for me, it's been that reclamation of like meeting those needs from, from a place of love, like uh, learning to ask vulnerably for what I need and for support. And yeah, rather than, rather than just kind of being the tyrant and swinging into the other way, which I know you'll chuckle at. <laughs> I was like, familiar. <laughs> 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 Yes, there's a, if I may just share something that's brought up that's kind of like taking place at a, I guess, more cultural level, I think it's important mm. to bring in mind, bring into the conversation, it's okay. Yeah. So, although we didn't use the word there, I think what is so required as an orientation, and regardless of the word we use, we use the word sovereignty, but it is to recognise that whilst we are looking out there to our partners to our families to our bosses ultimately to the world out there to make it okay for us to be we 
are going to be trapped because it's not going to change. Like we are going to be stuck in that place of looking out there to, to be saved, to be rescued, to have our needs met. And so a, a really important part of this journey is becoming sovereign. And it's not to say that we can't acknowledge, you know, right now it is a challenging world to live in for anyone, but certainly as someone who's sensitive, but to focus on that, to be a victim to that, to make that wrong, to keep saying like, okay, well, that needs to change really doesn't allow us to make the only real change that's possible, which is who we are, where we are coming from, how we're relating to ourselves and therefore to the world. And again, it's so, it's such a seductive way of relating, particularly again, when we've, we've experienced challenges, when we've experienced trauma even, it's completely understandable that we are going to then want to make everyone else responsible wrong for that completely understandable and we need to in order for anything to change we need to orientate differently we need to find a way back to our own power mm. i love that funnily enough i was just going to ask you about sovereign parenting <laughs> So, <laughs> um yeah because I think that was also a big part of my reclamation um of you know I mean I mean I was fortunate actually it was quite magical that I met you just as I'd given birth I guess or just as I was pregnant was if we were talking about the, the first episode that we ever did together on um, the summit I think I was pregnant at the time and then worked with you from when Lily was about um, three months old so uh, my whole experience I guess of parenting <laughs> was that of working with you and being in being in the work of soul and sovereignty so it's quite difficult to talk about parenting from a place of like <laughs> not being in that work I guess also um, but yeah I think that was a really really important um, piece to speak to I'm just wondering if there's any any examples of sovereign parenting that you can speak to uh, in terms of like practical tangible bringing it to life examples so I think there's one of the words that's um associated with sovereignty that I think is a really important one particularly in parenting and can be challenging for sure and that's leadership and it's in a world where we are often at one end of what you'll know I often describe as a shadow pole. So we'll either be in this like dictatorial, uh, controlling, very like, this is how you do this. This is how we parent, like, you know, controlling children in that often it will kind of come in maybe slightly um, less overt flavors of kind of parenting via reward and punishment so what is honestly the fairly mainstream way that we parent in our modern culture so that's kind of one end and then there's going to be others who have been redrawn to something and often in almost like a rejection of how they were parented and go okay I'm going to now parent from a like very permissive uh gentle child-led way of parenting and what I'm saying here is not at all to make either of those wrong. As ever, like all things have their place. We need to move through all these different ways of being in order to recognize kind of it's the union of two things that births the third thing. And that's really what, what I think we're talking about here with sovereign parenting is recognizing that in order for a child to be guided into the ways of this world, particularly the ways of this world as a sensitive person, we are going to need that leadership, which isn't kind of like, OK, I'm going to be all over here and let the child lead because they're not in a place where they know the the ways of this world. Not over here where we're going to be controlling and punishing them and forcing them into fitting our idea of what it means to be a child. But leading, leading, leading again, as ever from love. But is that word, I think, can be most challenging for us particularly if we are more drawn down to that child-led way of parenting if that feels quite natural to us to really occupy that space of leadership in parenting can be quite confronting but I think that is the part that is um, most important to be aware of when we're talking about sovereign parenting and of course this is so nuanced this is so subtle 
this isn't um therefore it looks like this is always going to be like meeting the moment in a sovereign way but recognizing our role a lot of the time with our children is that of a leader a leader mother of course lead like it's not you know just a leader it's within within our role as a mother so uh, as an example um if you just give me a moment I'll, I'll see if i can think of um an example in um that illustrates what i mean here so this is this is going to be actually a one of the ones one of the places that's probably most challenging for most parents in our modern world actually regardless mm. of sensitivities and it's this way that this world is going headlong into technology social media like more and more extreme forms of you know violence and video games and things like that and probably if there's anywhere that is most calling for our leadership with our children it's that because they are not equipped with the ability to navigate that they just aren't like we barely are as adults they certainly aren't like we were not designed to be in this kind of just constant relationship with these this kind of technology that we're now surrounded by and so again this is going to be in like a constantly evolving relationship and conversation this isn't a kind of one and done thing at all but just speaking personally in relationship with my own children this is something that my husband and I absolutely take the lead on we have a, we have a very clear sense of what will or won't be serving in terms of our children's use of technology and social media which obviously is constantly evolving according to their ages and all those things but we take the lead on that we don't just let them say okay well I want to be able to um, for example my children are um, have much less access to all sorts of things compared to their classmates um, they're not allowed to use social media at all for example if they had been kind of allowed free choice, I'm sure they'd be using all the social media that their friends are. And yet it's, it's a place that we're leading. We lead in conversation with them. We're explaining why that's the case. We talk to them about it. We take into account their feelings about it. What's interesting is that modeling of leadership becomes more and more innate to them as well, where they actually now will both say they prefer ha that, that, that they're not on social media. They say things like, you know, this is how I would parent my children, that I would, you know, do these things like much more slowly than is perhaps typical, you know, out within you know their classmates and their peers. Um, but it really required us to sort of very be clearly like standing strong in those principles and lead from that place. Again, not as in a controlling like you can't have it because, you know, it's not appropriate or down here like you take the lead. But us to stand in that place of leadership, which is in that constant communion with all the things, including how they're feeling about it, what what that, what's going to serve them, their ages, but to take the lead. Mm, I love that. I love that because uh, it reminded me of um, even just the with Lily is a and I know she's obviously not on social media but I'm thinking in terms of what you said about explaining I think that's been something that even as a very young um child you know a toddler I so I always try and explain to Lily like what's you know what's what that what the choice is being made for and, and also invite her into choice which I think is again something that's not commonly seen as what you should be doing with a toddler um and even uh, it reminded me too of like how you often talk about um the, the costs, the, the sovereign price, the, the price that we pay to make, to be leaders. Um, and reminded me of the year and a half of Lily sleeping on Pete's chest. <laughs> <laughs> when, because we just, it just didn't feel aligned to have her in her, in a, in a cot in a different room and leaving her to cry. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's particularly a question there, but it just reminded me of kind of the elements of journeying with sovereignty from my own journey with you. Mm. And again, and how, this, and how that's kind of paid the price because Lily's mm. now super confident. It feels like it was the right choice, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's it's a question that we can only ever answer for ourselves. Like, what is sovereignty in this, mm. in this particular example, in this particular dynamic? What is that for me? 
because it could look like mm. if we're looking at someone else from the outside yeah. looking in it could look like it isn't sovereignty yeah we don't know like it really is something that we can only know ourselves um and again and which is very individual to everybody's child because that prescription that I've just said there isn't a prescription that was just what was aligned and right for me exactly that oh, yes. Lily. Mm. Mm. yeah precisely mm. Mm. gorgeous that's really helpful um we've got a question from the secret witch society group so i thought i'd ask that um because we're coming up to completion but um so one of the questions was can you talk to how the wild can guide us in this please so by this obviously <laughs> being being a sensitive uh sensitive parent with sensitive children mm. I love that question and as I mentioned earlier when I was talking about um, the way that one of the very first invitations we'll make to anyone working with us is to go out and just find a tree find a tree to create a relationship with and the reason we do that as, as you'll know is because it will start to allow yourself to open into a way of being that we typically just don't have access to culturally there's there's other ways we can do that but that for many people is the most accessible way we can do that literally like most of us do have access to a tree um somewhere like fairly close by and to have that even and so i could take this out wider you know like whether that be going for a sit spot or whether it be going for a wild wander but for the moment i'm just going to use the tree as the kind of example of of the wild to have something where we are choosing on a regular basis to go visit a tree already is like a choice that we're making from a place that makes no sense culturally it's like that has no value culturally what's that going to give you how's that helping you to produce How's that helping you to function better? And it just doesn't make sense. And so the very like fact that we're choosing something that somehow feels so deeply right, so natural, and we're going to do it anyway, even though it doesn't completely make sense why we're doing it, that already is starting to step back in a direction towards ourselves. And then talking to specifically to those of us who are sensitive or whether it be our children making those invitations to help them spend more time in nature in the wild it allows us to start to open those ways that we are more sensitive and open in a way that isn't bombarding is allowing them to start to be a gift you know the example i gave you where it's like for me to try and recognize my openness and my sensitivity as a gift if I'm standing in the middle of Tesco's like it's not I mean I often need to like if I go to a busy supermarket I often have to come and like lay in a dark room when I get home whereas if I spend time in the wild I get to an opportunity to know myself in a way where it's like huh so the ways that I can attune to what's happening with the tree or what's happening in the environment around me or noticing the ways the habits of we have a, a quite a lot of red kites in in my local area to notice the habits of the red kites and also perhaps the symbolism of me seeing this group of red kites on this particular day it starts to open you into a way of being that takes you back to this sense of like perhaps I'm able to notice these things, care about these things, make meaning about these things in a way that allows me to know this, these parts of myself in a different way to if all I ever know is how I am in school or how I am in an office. Mm, I love that. That's really gorgeous. Mm. And it strikes me that there's also like uh, what came up for me as you were talking about that there is that th these things in nature and I say everywhere is, you know, and everything is an archetypal remedy, but it's almost like nature is reflecting and offering us these archetypal remedies to know ourselves better. Mm. I was um, I had this realization just recently um, that was so helpful because, as you know, I broke my foot uh, almost three weeks ago. And so where I'm normally, I spend so much time in the wild, like so much. And 
I haven't been able to. And it was so interesting looking at the impact on me and what's been coming up for me and what that's meant and what's that shown me. It's been a really important time for me to kind of know myself at this deeper level. And because I guess where I am in my journey, I don't need the connection with the, with the wild in the same way as I once did. Once it was crucial, absolutely crucial. I do not think that I would be where I am in my journey, in my work, in my life without that deep nature immersion that has been such an important part of my path. At this point, it isn't it isn't the same. It doesn't ha- I don't need it in the same way. And what this has been allowing me to realize is how most of us ultimately do have a deep, however conscious of it we we are or not, we have a deep longing for union with whether we want to call it God's spirit to like know ourselves as that, that part of the whole. And we will have fantasies about what that is because we can't know that directly until we are fully like embodied in that. And so our fantasies of, you know, that could come via religion or it could come via, um, I don't know, if we're probably a little bit less conscious, it might come via like having success. We have these ideas of I will I will have that feeling of wholeness, that feeling of union via doing this thing. The wonderful thing about nature, it's as close to that, to to wholeness, to oneness, to spirit, to God. It's like the immediacy of it. Of course, nothing really is more close than anything else. Like my glass is just as close to it as a tree. But there is something about the way the natural world shows itself to us that is closer to that in a way Mm. that we can really it's it's, I guess harder to have fantasies about it where we're like okay this will save me but it's also invites us into a way of being that is kind of like closer to what it is to be whole and so that's Mm. what I've really seen just over the last few weeks of like ah so interesting how what I projected on nature was perfect and was was needed I don't need to project on it in the same way as I did but my goodness, thank God we've got that. We've all got that. That can help mm. us to walk home. Mm, I love that so much. <laughs> I love that you're, you've got your glass as well. <laughs> this, is, this is basically God. <laughs> <laughs> this glass is God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gorgeous. Um, well, that feels complete from my end in terms of what... Um, what we wanted to explore I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to add specifically before we complete oh what um occurs to me is I'm going to quickly look it up actually it's just um popped into my head I just want to be able to quote this correctly um because I think this is this is important I think for you know all of us um to know as parents but I think particularly those of us who are parenting um sensitive children and it's a quote by lr nost and you might have seen me share this at various points but it's just occurred to me and it says it's not our job to toughen our children up to face a cruel and heartless world it's our job to raise children who will make the world a little less cruel and heartless Mm. and has really brought up emotion and for me that saying instead of saying toughen up we could say close up to become less Mm. sensitive to desensitize it's not not our job to do that it's understandable we might want to do that to protect them Mm. but what if their sensitivity their openness is there for a reason what if it's meant to act as medicine for the world Mm. what then that's so beautiful. I'm really glad that you shared that to complete. It was like a really beautiful way to finish. Um, mm. Yeah, so gorgeous. Um, where can people find out more about you and your work is my final question. Thank you for the invitation. Currently, not for much longer, but currently you can find <laughs> out all about the work that we do, which is uh, Myriad and includes uh, a podcast at wakingthewild.com. If you're listening to this in future, 
at some point over the next six months or so, we will be found at bemythical.com. <laughs> Very exciting. Ooh. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us all about neurodivergence and parenting. <laughs> it's been uh, it's been really gorgeous to have you on the show um after after all this time <laughs> mm, my pleasure yes it was a gorgeous and a wide-ranging conversation I, I love where we went yeah me too thank you very much mm, i loved that episode here are my takeaways we can often judge ourselves as bad mothers yet what this really means is we are feeling my children are not behaving in a way that my family culture or school deems is an okay way to behave we're actually making ourselves and our children wrong for something that is a neutral difference or divergence to the cultural norm if we look at indigenous cultures we can see we are all innately wired to be sensitive Humans weren't born for the modern world and its bright lights, smells, chemicals, electricity, devices, and so we learn to close down to even just function. If we've been raised in a culture that has us try and fit nicely into a system where we follow the rules, we will value fitting in, and it will require us to heal those wounds and free ourselves from the conditioning to welcome these sensitive aspects of ourselves and our children and free ourselves from judgment. The things we think are our problems are actually literal gifts. Those wounds and gifts will be different for everyone depending on what our soul is here for. But for example, Leanne's sensitivity to what's going on and her heightened awareness to spirit was a gift as she was here to be a shaman. Sensitivity is a gift if we're here to be healers. To parent powerfully, we need to know and honour our boundaries. Without that, we won't be able to parent, at least not in a conducive and sustainable way. Yet that's been made culturally wrong too. We're told we should be access all areas to our children and not have time to ourselves, that we shouldn't have needs. And it takes deep healing to recognise we need boundaries in place. Powerful parenting requires leadership, which needs us to look sovereignly at what's right for us as parents and what's right for our children and make powerful aligned choices. If you'd like to get the show notes and links for everything we've chatted about in this episode, head to www.secretwitch.co.uk. If you know a secret witch who would love this episode, please share with them to help them liberate themselves. And so you don't miss out on next week's episode, head to your podcast app of choice and hit subscribe. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time.